So tonight is the first of our series. She stole that thought too. Uh, first of eight every Thursday night for the next nine weeks, because one night we, we're going to have a party here. Uh, <clears throat> there are this uh, segues to the fact that the, you're in the freight shed and uh, we have a number of events going on here uh, during the course of the summer. Our website, MF ship.org will tell you what those uh, are and i encourage you to go and check that check that out so tonight for the first uh, for our first speaker uh, we have margaret wilson margaret has come as she said from england she stole that fact too that was on my schedule margaret's come here but she has not uh, uh, not recent she now she's come many times before and she was involved in the archaeology dig uh, down on popham beach which began the story of the ship that you are seeing out through the uh, the construction of the ship that you see out through here. Uh, Margaret came uh, initially when she was uh, uh, with her husband coming doing medical research in Seattle visiting there. She met Jane Stevens. Jane Stevens is the, the visitor's center at the end of the hall is named for Jane. Uh, we would encourage you to go visit that after the talk uh, and our store will be open as well down there. Um, let me just say that Margaret's been interested in the early uh, settlers that came, the travelers that came here. Uh, she re it resulted in one of the earlier books on this, Norm Begat Navigators, uh, which you can get on Amazon uh, if you'd like. And uh, English titled Early English Voyages to the New England, uh, Early English Voyages to New England. And uh, that is the topic for her talk tonight. Margaret, thank you very much for coming and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. I can. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and hello to everybody and uh, hello to all the Zoom watchers. Um, it's a pleasure, I can say, to be back in this wonderful shed and to be giving a talk in, I'm saying, um, at, and we were down at the Water's Edge restaurant on Pittsburgh, and um, we were standing outside looking at the planets, and there were two lined up. In fact, there might have been three, but we didn't know much about it. And two people came out and watched with us, and one was a man called Fred Hill, who became the president of Maine's first ship eventually. And he told us all about the planets. He knew far more about it than we did. And he then we got talking and he asked us back to his house and we had a delightful time. And in his house was a picture of Sir John Popham. And I was amazed to see this. And then we really got talking about Popham and what we should do and, um, I, he said, I think the person you must go and see is somebody called Jane Stevens. Go and ring on her bell. So I said, well, I don't know her. Don't you worry, he said. Go and ring on her bell. And she, we went up the hill towards the, the fort and um, we rang this wonderful bell outside Jane's house and she came out and she is, was the most delightful person. And um, it's not working. <laughs> Yeah. Another problem. <laughs> I don't know what you did to it last, last time. Something. <laughs> ah, thank you. What did you do then? Okay. All right. So lovely picture of Jane in her house talking about um, Popham and we had some delightful visits with her and she really is missed so much in this part of the world. Um, but in fact, I'm not really here to talk about Jane. <laughs> I'm here to talk about how the navigators got over to Popham Beach eventually. And what was the impetus for this great voyage over here? Well, it went way back. And, um, and so you might wonder why the Europeans actually crossed the unknown Atlantic and why then? Well, 
there were various things. There was the desire for paradise, really, in the oriental spices of the Far East. And um, then, of course, the lure of gold and silver, um, always wanted by everybody, greed and envy. And of course, that would be leading to adventure and discovery and ultimately leading to colonization. Now, this is the, um, the spice road that, um, in fact, it's called, it's the Silk Road, really. Uh, in the second century BC, the Silk Road um, was established from the Mediterranean over there, um, right through to China, um, with the trading, big trading place at Samarkand here, and um, spurs down to Tibet and India and up to the Gobi Desert and so on. And uh, the traders brought back all these wonderful silks and um, treasures from, from the East. Um, in the first century AD, the Romans and Greeks were trading directly with India, obtaining pepper and other spices. And from Alexandria, the goods were dispatched to Constantinople and Venice, where fortunes were made in these clearing houses for the onward um, westward journey. And as they sought new lands in Northern Europe, uh, the, the Romans took with them um, spices to make all their newly found food more palatable. And then soon the rest of Europe got hooked on this. And that's a spice ship. <laughs> um, and in England in the 12th century, um, the Guild of Pepperers was established. And it was used for trading and even for rents. And I, I don't know if you've heard of a peppercorn rent, but um, it was so valuable at that time. You probably just sprinkle pepper all over your food now. Don't think about it. But in those days, you had to go right across to China to get it. So soon the, um, I think we've gone to, um, the journey across land was too much. And so they decided to go by ship. And of course that was also too much for people. It was very long, arduous journeys. Lots of people died. And uh, so eventually, but everybody was still obsessed with spice. So they did want their spice and this aura of paradise. And then in the 15th century, there was trouble. Um, the demand was becoming as I say, an obsession, um, but the sea captains had just had enough of it. So they thought another route had to be found and maybe they could go west and find China going west. And surely the land of spice couldn't be far away if they went from Europe that way, surely. So two things happened. In 1492, as you all know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and opened up the way to the Spanish and Portuguese to plunder South America. And they filched enormous hordes of gold and silver and brought them back to Europe. Um, he was, of course, Columbus was always convinced he was in the Far East. He never realized there was a big continent there. He only got to the Caribbean and South America. He didn't actually ever step onto North America, as far as I know. Is that falling off? Sorry. Is it okay? Any nearer? Okay. <clears throat> and then in 1497, John Cabot, thinking he could find a Northwest Passage to the Orient, found a new found land, which was quite something. And he was the first one who actually stepped onto the American continent. And he didn't know he had, he thought he was in China as well for a bit. But he did discover the Grand Banks. And um, I just would like to see, show you the, the sort of routes that these people tried to do. First of all, we had the um, uh, Columbus who went on the blue line there. Oh, sorry. Um, no. Um, the blue line here, these were the trade winds and they took Columbus right down to the Caribbean and then back up that way. That was the return route. Now, Cabot tried to go from Bristol, England, about there, 
skirting Ireland and over to Newfoundland. And he did this in a straight line. Um, and hadn't he just did it by celestial, the stars, just following the stars. Um, it took him actually 33 days to do that. But as you can see, the winds would have been distinctly unfavorable. Anyway, Giovanni Cabotti, known in England as John Cabot, a Venetian and contemporary of Columbus, I think they probably knew each other, had arrived in Bristol hoping to persuade Henry. And uh, Henry actually funded this voyage. And there is John Cabot sitting in a very uncomfortable position on Bristol docks. Um, we think he's not very well. <laughs> Um, but anyway, they did fund this, and Henry VIII said, you must go out, seek and discover and find all such newly discovered lands and subdue, occupy and possess all such in the king's name. Then he convinced the Bristol merchants of the benefits of reaching the Orient and India by passage to the West. And the merchants built him a ship, and it was called Matthew, named after his wife, Matia. Now there's Matthew, and that was built in the 90s. That is a reconstruction, and you may see similarities to a nice ship sitting out there. Um, and it, at the time, in 1997, it was the centerpiece of the Festival of the Sea. Um, and then she made a crossing to Newfoundland. I don't know whether Virginia is going to go that far, but um, anyway, she did get there and she went all the way around Newfoundland and she came back again. And she was built in two years. <laughs> um, she's a, she really is a lovely craft, beautifully, beautifully built, as you can see. Um, there she is again. This is in um, Bristol Basin, as it's called. Um, a Cabot sailed from Bristol then, and um, an eminent naval historian, Samuel Elliot Morrison, states, this must be considered one of the most successful bits of celestial navigation in the early era of discovery. You can see he sailed from here across to here, and he arrived. I don't know if anybody's been to Longso Meadows, the Viking site that was discovered in the 1960s. Well, Cabot had no idea, of course, of this, and he landed within five miles of Lanzo Meadows, which was amazing, really. And then he traveled south, down here, and uh, you can see he, he landed there, Cap de Grat, and he went down to Bonavista, and that is a sort of area that he would have turned up. Forget the car and the boat, that wasn't there at the time. Um, and the Canadians built a, a rather nice memorial to, to him. Um, he, in fact, raised, he raised banners to the King of England when he got there, <clears throat> found evidence of human habitation, a fire and possibly dung of tame animals. But he must have been amazed at this strange place because he kept bumping into things like icebergs and whales. And in fact, he brought back a huge whalebone, and that now resides in St. Mary Redcliffe Church in Bristol. It is still there. Uh, but he must have had his doubts seeing these whales that he was anywhere near China. Uh, anyway, he returned to his ship and he went sailing on and went right round here and back again. And when he got here, he passed over the Grand Banks and he saw an awful lot of fish and particularly the fish called cod. Um, so he went back to where he started, in fact, up here, and then he sailed back again. Um, I think he was blown off course slightly. So he went down here and then back up here, but he did it really very quickly. Um, as he departed on the 20th of July and arrived home on August the 6th, which wasn't bad. Then on return, he persuaded Henry VII to fund another voyage. Um, he departed in 1498 and never returned. 
But his greatest legacy, of course, was his first-hand knowledge of the Grand Banks and the Incredible Cod. And very soon, um, English fishermen were, and, and European fishermen in general, from the 1550s, going over to a Newfoundland and getting lots and lots of fish and bringing them back to Europe, um, where people were very, very hungry for fish. Um, it was Catholic Europe, and uh, it, the Pope had decreed that it wasn't just Fridays you had fish, you had to have fish on lots of other days too. Um, anyway, this was a very, very lucrative market, and people forgot all about China, because this was where the wealth was going to be found with the fish. There's rather a nice fish, a cod that we photographed in Newfoundland Museum. Um, but by the early 1500s, it was realized there was indeed a huge American continent, but how substantial was it? Giovanni de Verrazzano, an Italian sailing under the French flag in his ship La Dauphine, crossed the Atlantic by the southern route and made his way up the east coast. The year was 1524, and he was looking for a way through to the Orient. He sailed on the seaward side of Pamlico Sound. And he looked over here to see the sea. He couldn't see this bit. And he thought, well, this is the Indian Ocean, obviously. Has to be. <laughs> um, so subsequent maps were drawn by Verrazzano's cartographer brother, who showed America with a narrow waist. I don't know if you can quite understand. That's Florida there. And then there's this narrow waist where Pamlico Sound was supposed to be. And this is the Mare Indicum, which is the Indian Ocean. And this was put on maps um, for the next century and confused everybody. Verrazzano continued north, discovered the Hudson. And of course, we've got Verrazzano Narrows Bridge at the Hudson River. Um, and he thought it would be possible to sail up through it to the ocean on the far side, but that didn't work either. He encountered Indians, and when he got as far as present day Maine, he heard the word Orumbega or Norumbega, which was also put in his brother's map and subsequent maps. And you can see Norumbega covered a very large piece. It's Jay Cabot is there. And uh, this appeared on a lot of lot of maps. Um, and when he went up there, he also heard that the land of Norumbega was a place of great treasure with a city, a lovely city, at its heart. Well, Indians weren't really building cities like that at that time, but um, he went back with all the tales of these wonderful treasures and that um, he could find in these cities and people were wearing pearls and jewelry and there was a lot of wealth there. So people got very interested in that. Um, and there's another one of, you can see how important Norum Baker was in those days, um, where the city is here. The, it's a slightly better map that one because we've got Newfoundland, which is slightly strange shape and then the gulf of st lawrence here um but the, the news of this spread like wildfire and it, um people toured the pubs to say how wonderful this place would be to go and visit and really it was the place to go was norumbega but the lack of funds and organizing ability um, for an expedition was not forthcoming um, yes, um, but the still great envy of the Spanish and their South American treasures, the precious stones and gold and silver and copper. So Norumbega was put on the back burner as the lure of the Orient was still present. Perhaps there was a passage around the top of America, right around the top, maybe that's the way to go. So George Best, who did this map, um, he was a captain of Martin Frobisher's ship, an Elizabethan explorer who made three attempts to discover the Northwest Passage, which of course was, should be going right through here. 
out here, and of course that would be China right there. So that's good. We'll do that one. Um, but they, he made, and um, Frobisher made three attempts to discover the Northwest Passage, um, a route from the Atlantic via the Arctic Ocean to the Pacific, and their ultimate goal, China. Um, the first attempt was in 1576. He was followed by John Davis from Devon, um, three voyages that took place between 1585 and 87, but all were in vain. They had a terrible time up there. Um, we've now entered what we like to think is Elizabeth's golden age. It had not always been so. In 1558, at the age of 25, she inherited a country wracked with poverty, religious turmoil, near bankruptcy, and a population with a tendency to lawlessness and ruthlessness. Most of the lawlessness taking place in the high seas, where piracy was indiscriminate and widespread. Um, her father, Henry VIII, had ruled over a Catholic country until needing a male successor and quarreling with the Pope, famously dispensed with the Catholic faith, as we all know. On his death, his daughter Mary, ardent Catholic, married Philip II of Spain, and the country reverted back to Catholicism. Elizabeth, firmly Protestant, succeeded Mary in 58, 1558, um, with her father's spirit and was determined that no prelate or foreign prince could dictate to the English, and certainly not to Elizabeth. She would have fused the hand of Philip in marriage and scuppered his plans to bring England to heel. And I can imagine her stamping her foot. And it did remind me rather, she did remind me slightly of Margaret Thatcher in those days, um, when someone, probably the EU, was trying to dictate to her. And her response was, no, no, no. I don't know if you remember her saying that, but it's often put on our television. <laughs> um, so there she is in all her glory, ruling over this. I'll just go back to that. Um, she partly succeeded uh, because she surrounded herself with great men. Knowledge of our world was moving forward in leaps and bounds and growing expertise in astronomy, navigation, cartography, shipbuilding, and seamanship were bringing England to prominence and power. And if we can pinpoint any two decades that exemplifies the golden age, um, it is the 1570s and the 1580s. And Elizabeth was greatly encouraged, um, and she greatly encouraged the exploitation of the fisheries and the Grand Banks of Newfoundland as it provided mariners with invaluable seafaring knowledge. And that was such a thing for, for Britain that um, we were surrounded by sea, we had to be good at sailing. Sir Francis Drake had certainly navigated the world um, between 1577 and 80. The defeat of the Armada in 1588 was definitive proof of England and its people being able to rule the waves and our previously backward country at the far end of, of a far edge of, of Europe um, was filled with a new confidence to do anything and go anywhere. And one of these men who was at the forefront of going places uh, was a man called Humphrey Gilbert. There's Humphrey. Now he lived in Devon, where we come from, and uh, he had a most wonderful house, which is still there and which we know very well. Um, I will actually just show you, this is the West Country. This is known as the West Country in England. I expect a lot of you have been there. Um, and we have Devon um, down here, Somerset, Devon, Somerset and Cornwall are the main places where the navigators came from, really, the true navigators. And um, we have wonderful Plymouth Sound, where so many people left from. Um, this is the Fowl at Falmouth, and uh, this is the X going to Exeter with Topsom there, um, and that's where we come from, just around here. So we know the, the area pretty well. Um, let's see if we can find a picture. That is the dart. Uh, 
and we've got this is where Humphrey Gilbert was born at a place called Greenway which was then pulled down and made into a beautiful house and that was where Agatha Christie lived for so long it now belongs to the National Trust and um, and you can go and visit it but all these castles were filled with very wealthy people um, Berry Pomeroy Castle and uh, near Malden is where um, Humphrey Gilbert's seat was the um, let's see if we can try. that's that's his castle that's where he lived and this is a National Trust property which you can go and visit and the people who lived there um, uh, Jeffrey Gilbert and his wife came over here for the 400th anniversary of the um, of of um, Popham so it was it was a great time I'll show you some pictures at the end um, I think I'm going to have to go through this bit quickly that's another picture of the castle that is Agatha Christie's house <laughs> and it was the Gilbert's property and it's right on the dart overlooks the dart it's a very beautiful place that is a house that's still there and belonged to john davis who went up to the arctic um, and he and uh, the gilbert brothers there were three of them um, and their half brother sir walter raleigh um, probably learnt to sail all together on on the dart i like to think of them all, all together as boys in boats <laughs> Um, so the band of brothers on the dart became interested in the idea of a northwest passage with the possibility of planting a colony in america in the 1570s humphrey wrote a discourse of a discovery for a new passage to Cathay, which is china and was the first to stress the importance that english colonies be established in the new world um younger half brother walter raleigh was listening in so in order to get queen elizabeth interested in their plans humphrey gilbert wrote a treatise how to annoy the king of spain <laughs> this certainly had the desired effect and in june 1578 the queen after further badgering from sir humphrey granted him letters patent to discover search find etc um, essentially giving Sir Humphrey the first English colonial charter. Now the lure of Norumbega was raising its head again, and Sir Humphrey, arch land speculator, set about raising money by deeding dubious land grants to various people without having set foot on the place. It certainly didn't belong to him. For instance, he granted 3 million American acres and two fifths of all precious metals and pearls to be discovered to his friend Philip Sidney, on condition that he, Humphrey, got a good return on it. So in 1583, there's another picture of the dart, um, Humphrey set sail with five ships, and uh, this is his small frigate called Squirrel which is in the castle um, and it had a complement of about 260 men these five ships the ships took masons carpenters mineral men a small orchestra morris dancers a hobby horse and many light conceits to delight the savage people they left on june the 11th um, 1583 and arrived in St. John's August the 5th, having been badly blown off course. Um, this is the entrance to St. John's wonderful harbor. And um, at the time, there were 36 European fishing boats there. He had no idea there'd be anybody there. So you can imagine the scene. Humphrey sailed merrily in and the wind dropped between the high cliffs and he veered onto a notorious rock and stuck fast much to the delight of the fisherman who rode out to pull him off and he was a foul temper <laughs> and then there was a grand ceremony when um, gilbert claimed newfoundland for the queen and the fishermen didn't mind they really they didn't live there they always went home at um, in the winter they just went for the fish in the summer and um 
so they thought, yes, this is fine. And everybody forgot that John Cabot had actually claimed it a long time before, <laughs> at least a century before. Uh, the ceremony was followed by a two week party when the ship's supplies of food and drink were shared with the fishermen and there was much merriment. By now, many of the crew had disappeared <laughs> and the slightly depleted fleet left to sail south and west to Norumbega, their original goal. But one of the ships foundered and most of the crew were drowned and the rest of the people persuaded Gilbert it was too late in the season to go and set up a colony on an unknown place. So he insisted on sailing in his tiny squirrel all the way back home and then close to the Azores they hit bad weather and the squirrel was lost with all hands including Sir Humphrey. Um, but he was perhaps the very first Englishman to attempt to establish a colony in the New World. And then, of course, enter young Walter Raleigh, and I'm not going to dwell on him because there's too much about him, and he sort of went further south, although he never actually arrived on the American continent. He was always sailing over there, saw a Spanish ship, and of course had to go and get the gold. He was a, a, a good old pirate, was, was Walter Raleigh. Um, but he appeared in the Queen's Court with his pronounced Devon accent, and a slightly lower bar birth than some of his contemporaries. But he soon became the Queen's favoured and favourite courtier and difficult to resist. Walter Raleigh looking like that with his charms and good looks. Um, this famous miniature was painted by Nicholas Hilliard, who in fact was a painter in Exeter, near where we are. Um, but so Sir Humphrey's patent now reverted to Walter Raleigh, who was itching to follow in his half-brother's footsteps. And Raleigh's star as a promoter of colonization was in the ascendant. And of course, he sent his people off to Roanoke and eventually they all died. So he rather took a back foot after that for a bit. Um, let's see if we can just have a bit more of Raleigh. This is where he lived in this house. He loved, he, they were, his family were tenants. Um, so he tried to buy it back when he was very wealthy, but uh, the man who owned it wouldn't agree. And it was always very sad for him. But um, we walk around this house often. It's, um, it's only about a mile from where we live. It's a lovely, lovely building. And that is the um, village of East Budley uh, where you can see the church up there. This is where Raleigh has his, um, his family pew in the church there, it's still there. And recently this um, statue was put up um, at the top of the village, it's sort of up there now. Um, so it's quite uh, interesting to suddenly, he, he's risen up again in people's minds. Um, so now we sort of continue on to the Reverend Richard Hacklett. Um, it was the year of the Armada in 1588. Um, Richard Hacklett, geographer and astronomer, promoter of settlement in, in America and well versed in navigation, was preparing his principal navigations for publication. Um, I might just read this to you because this was the title of it. Principal navigations, voyages and discoveries of the English nation made by sea or over land to the most remote and furthest distant quarters of the earth at any time with the compass of these 1500 years. <laughs> that was the title. Um, it was published in 1589 and provided almost everything known about the early English voyages to North America and elsewhere until that time. And a second extended edition um, was produced in three volumes and contained 1,600,000 words. This brought Hacklett fame and he was rewarded because he was then a vicar, he was a rector, and with the rectory of Wuthering Set in Southwark and the prebends of Bristol Cathedral and Westminster Abbey, so he really had moved up in the world. Um, these places are still here, which is interesting. That is the church and this was the rectory. Um, where he wrote his books, lovely old building. Um, but I think a very little time was spent in the church, which is adjacent to this lovely old house, um, because most of the time is spent writing his books. 
If he wasn't there, he was down at the docks at nearby Woodbridge listening to seamen stories. Now, this is on the other side of the country. It's not Devon. Um, but his publications had a huge effect on would-be explorers. So we've now reached the early 1600s and close to Elizabeth's, the end of Elizabeth's reign. She died in 1603. Um, and still the English had failed to get a foothold on the American continent to the West. But between 1602 and 1608, there began a series of voyages to Norham Baker, which was now gradually becoming um, known as North Virginia, roughly from Cape Cod to Maine. Is that, too, is that all right? Yeah, okay. Um, these people were, there were about 25 voyages during that time over from Europe to Virginia, as it was then called. Um, but the chief people that we were interested in was um, Gosnold, Pring, Weymouth, who turned up here, um, and Hannam and Pring also turned up here. Um, and then, of course, we had the Popham colony, um, Popham and Gilbert. Um, this was the book that we all used to want to read. It was just full of everything to do with Popham. And it was a, a must for anybody interested in the Popham um, project. But uh, it, it was a very interesting book. Um, it was full of the narratives of all these voyages and it was published by the Hacklett Society and brilliantly interpreted by editors, David and Alison Quinn, they're very famous people. Um, it became the go-to book for anybody working here. And the importance of these narratives written on the, um, by those on board cannot be overestimated. The narrators observed, experienced, and wrote in much detail what they did and saw each day. And each voyage reads like a boy's own adventure. It was largely through the narratives of the seafarers, accumulated and edited by Richard Hacklett and his successor, Samuel Purchase, that Elizabeth's England began her steady climb into the limelight of world affairs. So deep in the heart of Sussex and a stone's throw from Wuthering Set, um, where Richard Hackett was hard at work, was a family called Gosnold, um, and they lived at Otley Hall. Now, this is a private house, but Michael and I went one day, walked down the drive and knocked on the door because we knew that Gosnold had lived here. <laughs> and they let us in and they were very kind. And uh, I was able to take photographs and all the journeys that Gosnell made um, were planned in this particular room, which I thought was a good thing to have here. <clears throat> um, so Go um, Gosnell, Bartholomew Gosnell was born in 1571 um, and was a privileged member of a well-established and well-connected family. Um, but he was enthralled by stories of the sea and had read about Verrazzano's accounts of uh, his travels up the east coast of America. Um, and at the age of 16, he studied law, but he soon came in contact with his neighbor, Richard Hacklett. Um, Gosnell became the answer to Hacklett's dreams as the young man became immersed in Hacklett's plans to organize an expedition to North Virginia. And by now, Gosnell had taken part in various privateering um, expeditions and was a competent sailor. Uh, he was frequently to be found in the West Country. So they plotted and planned and eventually um, Gosnell sailed um, in 1602 from Falmouth, right here, over to, and he sailed down the Carrick, if you, any of you have ever been to Falmouth, it's a magnificent harbour, I think it's the second deepest in the world or something. But these castles, each side here, uh, were built by Henry VIII, and you can go and visit them. Anyway, he sailed down through those castles and out into the Atlantic. And he actually, you can see his voyage here was, um, he went down here and more or less straight across. I mean, he, he, he did a very good journey there, but he was in a very old, rickety old ship called the Concord. And, uh, but the narrators wrote about it 
Um, but they didn't say anything unpleasant about voyages because, of course, it was going to be read by people back here, and they didn't want to think they were, you know, going to be seasick going over there. So they they missed out a lot of the voyage, but they concentrated very much on the actual um, landing and what they did. And of course, he um, arrived at Cape Cod, and he named Cape Cod. He also named Martha's Vineyard, and. Um, then from there he could see the Elizabeth Isles and the mainland and of course he had remembered Verrazzano's journey up there and he he thought he would go over there and have a look but in fact it all they had to curtail it because the Indians were upset with them because they had stolen a canoe so that wasn't a very happy thing so they, they all went home again in fact they, they did this really just for summer voyages they weren't going to stay there Um, I'm just missing some out here because I think I'm going on too long. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was the first one who, who went and the second one was um, Pring. Oh, is that, that was Cutty Hunk where you have the Gosnold. I mean, you still have these places. That's where they camped, they camped there. They were going to stay there, but they decided they would come home. Um, and they came home with a load of sassafras which was the plant of the time, curing everything from goodness knows what to syphilis. <laughs> that was the great cure-all. Um, so, so the next person to go was um, Pring. Now this is his memorial in um, Bristol in the church. And I don't think anybody would know who Pring is. People don't know anything about these heroes that went off. Um, but he, he landed on Cape Cod as well, and he took a whole load of people with him, and they brought back um, an Indian canoe as well, and people were fascinated by that. Um, in fact, they brought back so much sassafras that was a glut in the market, and they returned with this birch bark canoe, and um, people very into their boats whereof we brought one to bristol were in proportion like a wherry of the river thames 17 foot long and four foot broad made of a bark of a birch tree far exceeding in bigness those of england so once again the journal that resulted was one of great encouragement to would-be settlers particularly the detailed maps of the area that pring had drawn so in 2005 um, of course, Elizabeth had died by then. When Pring set off, they heard the day they left that Elizabeth had died. But uh, anyway, in, in 2005, along came George Weymouth. Now, he's the famous one around here, and everybody should know about Weymouth. Um, we, they had a, a symposium here. And if you can get hold of this book, I really do advise you to do so. It is extremely good and far better than anything I can tell you about Weymouth. So do, do seek it out if you can. But he lived here at Cockington in South Devon and it would have looked just like that and doesn't really look like that now. I think it's a bit of a staged thing, but... <laughs> and uh, he lived nearby, in fact, in this big mansion. So these people always lived very well. Now uh, he got over to this side and um, that is, I can't remember, Allen Island, I think it is that the, yes, well, Allen Island. Correct. Yeah. Um, and that's Monhegan, he, he landed on Monhegan. And in fact, he took with him um, a narrator called Rosier and Rosier's um, interpretation and, and uh, description of the adventures they had is probably the very best of all of them. Uh, so again, a great help to the promoters back home. Um, but he, what he did was to capture five Indians and um, took them home. And of course he, the Indians weren't very happy about it, but they were all right when they got there. In fact, they were fated at, at, in England and uh, did very, very well. Um, two, two of them were sent to Sir Fernando Gorges, 
Um, he was the man who actually was a proprietor of Maine in the end, and, um, and tutor Sir John Popham. So they were both great um, proponents of plantation and colonization in the New World. Um, the fate of the Indians over the next few years is fascinating because they were taught some English and were received with something like celebrity status and behaved with great dignity. They were much admired by their guardians who were able to learn much of value about their home territory. At least three were returned to their native lands in the hope they would act as guides in the future. So that's Weymouth arriving. And of course, that is um, on the back of that symposium book. Um, it's a Wyeth picture, N.C. Wyeth, which was done some years ago, I believe. Um, I just got one or two pictures of Indians because they, we, we, have you ever heard of Judd Hartman? He is a great sculptor in this part of the world and he sculpted these various Indians. Um, of course, they, the Indians lived along the seashore and um, fishing. And of course they then, they ate a lot of oysters and they made these huge mounds, these middens. And uh, that was taken some, I think the 19th century where the man who actually found them um, actually measured how many they had there. <laughs> but uh, let's just see if I can find that. Um, Yes, these beds were measured by Dr. Jackson in 1838 for his geological survey of Maine. He worked out that there were 44,906,000 cubic feet. The shells are chiefly of the oyster in mature condition and a very large size. They're horizontally disposed shell on shell ends to the shore. But it was noted that this ridge has been dug up and they were the shells were ground up for hen food it's a bit sad um, but it is still possible to see these depleted uh, middens that's quite a well-known spot um, but soon of course these indigenous people were about to be more or less wiped out when guns were provided and they killed each other and so on. Um, so now West what country, and yes, I think Norumbega sort of faded away after that, the Indians just faded. Um, West country interests now came together with the idea of planting a colony in North Virginia. Um, and much had been learned about the land and coastal regions with potential opportunities pointing to their great wealth. Surely mining was a great possibility. Of course it wasn't really. Um, and there was always the passage to the Orient around the corner. Uh, now we come to big Sir John Popham, uh, Lord Chief Justice of England. Um, he was quite a character. He excelled at his legal career and mingled with the great and the good at the Inns of Court. Um, his various claims to fame include being judge of the day at the trial of Guy Fawkes, and was the man who reluctantly sentenced Raleigh to death. He accumulated tremendous wealth through his legal activities and owned various mines and huge houses. There's Sir John, looking rather fine. That's one of his houses, um, a place called Littlecote Manor, which is still around. And that is it today, it's a hotel now. It's an amazing place. It's got a terrific history. Um, but anyway, so John became interested in American plantations when the population of England had reached 12 million. He thought it was far too crowded. What is it now? 65 million? Um, and a lot of unemployment and many rogues and ruffians. He felt that setting up a colony far away on the northeast coast, he could dump quite a lot of these unpleasant people and he had the money to fund it. And that's his memorial in Wellington Church. Now, we don't know if he's in it because he fell off his horse and killed himself and he fell into a pit of water. And at the time, nobody could find him and couldn't get to him. And so they built this big memorial. But to this day, I don't think anybody quite knows if he's in it. <laughs> this is a house belonging to Sir Fernando Gorges. It's amazing that all these houses still exist after so long. 
Um, we know that was a private house, of course, so we couldn't go in there. And Gorges lived on um, this island in the middle of Plymouth Sound, Drake's Island. And uh, he watched the ships going back and forth. And of course, when he was delivered of two or three Indians, um, he became extremely interested in, in the plantation ideas. Um, Now we come to, of course, James the um, first, who succeeded Elizabeth uh, in 1604. Not a very prepossessing chap, really. Mostly remembered for the King James Bible, the language of which we have known and loved down the centuries. But he also took an interest in colonization. And other people took forward the idea of settlement in South Virginia, and two companies were formed. Um, one in London and uh, the London Company and the other representing Plymouth and the West Country interests. Together they formed a joint stock company known as the Virginia Company. In 1606, James I signed the first Virginia Charter and the London and Plymouth companies felt the time is right to establish permanent colonies. So the Plymouth Company got its act together first and sent a some people as a preliminary visit. Um, but then in um, the following year, in 1607, the London Company set sail for South Virginia and founded the colony at Jamestown. The Plymouth contingent sailed two months later to North Virginia to settle the Popham colony, and the chief sponsor being Sir John Popham, with much backing from Sir Fernando Gorges. Both companies hoped this would be the beginning of mass immigration, as well as profitable commercial returns. Um, this is a Venn, this is actually done by um, um, Dr. Jeffrey Brain. Um, it's a Venn chart showing the different families who were connected and the different people, this is all from the West Country, and the different people you can see around who were actually involved in, in the Popham colony. But they were all interconnected and intermarried and they all knew each other well. Um, let's see, where are we now? Yes, this expanded family of promoters and would-be colonists saw a new world where aristocrats from the old world would transfer all their feudal rights and privileges, as well as their wealthy lifestyles, to their vast domains overseas. In fact, all they did was end up on a rocky shore. Um, this is Topsham in Devon. We call it sometimes Topsham and sometimes Topsham. Um, it's a place where we think the two ships to come to the Popham colony were victualled and they sailed from here down the River X, down the Channel and into the Atlantic. And that's a very short distance from where we live. It's a very old shipbuilding town, which doesn't build ships anymore. Um, but it, it, it's a fascinating place. And we think it's possible the Virginia might have sailed back to Topsham because it did really, but the two ships belonged to Sir John Popham and he lived nearby. So it's quite likely that they came into Topsham. Um, so anyway, most of you know the story of the Popham colony, I'm sure. And if you don't, you can, read about it at the end of the, the hall over there. Um, and I won't elaborate on that, but suffice to say that we know so much about the colony, largely stemming from draftsman John Hunt and his detailed plan of Fort St. George drawn on site. He completed his task in seven weeks after construction had started, and we can't assume that all the structures were built, but the plan shows a completed fort, um, Virginia, um, down here, built, and, um, and the garden planted up, and the stream running through the centre. 
and the storehouse is up and running and also Riley Gilbert's house. He was known as the Admiral. Um, and we all know that the, the copy of the, the plan was put aboard the Mary and John and taken back to England and delivered to the court of St. James and then it disappeared. And it was stolen, we think, by a Spanish ambassador to England. Um, and he sent it to Philip III in Spain, as the Spanish were keen to know what the English were doing up in the far north, northeast. The plan didn't surface again for 280 years. But amazingly, in 1888, it was found by an American historian in the archives of a Spanish museum. A century went by before a half-hearted attempt to locate the site being took place in the 1960s. And it wasn't until the 1990s that efforts were made to pinpoint and excavate the site. The key to finding and interpreting Fort St. George was John Hunt's map. It's a picture of Raleigh Gilbert, which was Humphrey Gilbert's son, and he was one of the leaders of the Popham colony. But eventually, um, their sponsors died in England. Um, Sir John Popham stupidly fell off his horse and killed himself. That was a pity because they didn't have a sponsor there. And um, Sir John Gilbert, um, who was back at Compton Castle, um, he died, and Raleigh Gilbert was very keen to go home and claim his inheritance. So they all packed up and they left. And sadly, this colony, which could have continued and could have been better than Jamestown, was abandoned. So there is a modern um, shipwright, which I thought you might like to see. <laughs> 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 and I managed to, I didn't, I wasn't here at the launch, but I thought I must try and get a picture of the Virginia. And so I photographed the YouTube and put it into the show. <laughs> but um, anyway, they all sailed back, of course, in the Virginia from Popham. And um, that, of course, is the, the new ship bobbing around out there. That's just a picture of the site of um, Fort St. George covered up and underneath is the, the fort. And that's um, Geoffrey Brain's book. He wrote so many books about the archeology. span And there he is um, during one of the digs, wielding his big stick. He kept us all in order, get on with your work. Um, and then he'd have a big horn that he'd blow and um, we'd all stop work for ice lollipops. And, uh, and the, the, um, the two people here, Krista and um, Fritz Muller, uh, were very stalwart um, diggers. They came up every year from Jamestown where they worked and they loved to pop them. They loved to dig here. And Geoffrey Bray must have been so thrilled when Finally, we, they uncovered a piece of the turf and they found a post hole right there. And of course, from there, he could measure, because of John Hunt's map being so good, he could measure from there to the next post hole. And uh, certainly for the, the storehouse, uh, he, he could, actually they could find each post hole because of the, the map. Very accurate drawing 400 years ago. And that was one of the finds, which is a, a corking tool, um, which I'm sure the Virginia people will know all about. That's just another picture of the dig and some of the pottery. And a lot of the pottery was um, came from uh, North Devon. And I did actually, I was on the dig for a week and I did actually dig up a piece of North Devon pottery. So I was pleased about that. And that's um, uh, Bud Warren, who was a, a, a great person in the dig. He, he knew a huge amount about um, the, the fort and the history. And he was a very good teacher. And he had a lot of these children from the school. And uh, 
they would learn about the fort and what was happening. And they were actually allowed to dig as well, I believe. That's a lovely site, such a pleasure to be on it. <laughs> and then we come to Topsham 400. And we came over for that in 16, in 2007 <clears throat> to celebrate with everybody. And uh, that's Bud Warren making, he was a master of ceremonies, I believe. And um, this was Geoffrey Gilbert from Compton Castle. Um, and these were some of the dignitaries that spoke at this. And that, I must see if I can find that bit about. Um, yes, the opening ceremonies began with invocations from the Penobscot tribal elder Reuben Butch Phillips, who performed a traditional smudge ceremony in which a mixture of sage, tobacco, cedar and sweet grass picked from the main coast were burned over a live ember set inside a clamshell. The ember was fanned with a wing of a bald eagle in the direction of the great spirit Mother Earth. He then dedicated the ceremony to the settlers of the Popham colony and the tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And that's Jane Stevens with Alex Popham, who is another person who came every year. He's very recently died and we're very sad to hear that. And there's Jane. Um, she had been a Popham resident for 27 years um, and lived on a house on, um, in a house on the site of Fort St. George. And she didn't know this until Dr. Brain's first excavation in 1997. But Jane's dedication to preserving the history of the Popham colony earned her the title of Honorary Mayor of Popham Beach. And she was presented with the title and a key to the town by Bill Perkins, co-chair of Popham 400. It was difficult to get pictures at the time because there were so many people there. But that's dear Jane going to get her award and become mayor, honorary mayor. <clears throat> and that is Alex Popham King as Sir John Popham. He made a wonderful Sir John. And then over 100 Pophams arrived in force for the celebrations. And these four were delighted to play their role of their ancestors involved with the Popham colony. Um, we've got Alan Popham as George Popham on the left, I think. Ooh. I messed it up. <laughs> Will it? Let's see if I can find it here. No, that's not going to do it. I don't know where that one's come from. Okay, yeah. is that it? No, we've still got that on there. Yes, almost finished. Um, thank you. Um, where was I? Um, yes. So there's um, and Jeffrey Gilbert as as Raleigh Gilbert. Um, there. This one doesn't work now. <laughs> and John Popham and I've forgotten who this one was. Um, Alex, oh yes, and uh, Michael Popham as Edward Popham. All these people were supposed to have been at the Popham colony, but they love dressing up as that. And then we continued the celebrations on the beach and uh, we had flares. It was, it was a wonderful, wonderful evening. And uh, then there's another picture of the resplendent um, Sir John Popham, and he's just lit the fire. And after a very memorable celebration, the Kennebec returned to its calmness. Thank you.